I'm uh, a minister in the United Church of Canada, but I'm here tonight because I'm a member of the Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East, CJPLE, and we have a Hamilton chapter of that organization, a very active group of people, and we are um, presenting or hosting, I guess is a better word, this debate tonight um, with two members of the Green Party of Canada. So before I go to announcing or introducing them, I would like to um, ask Doug Massey, who's a member of Bartonstone United Church, if he would welcome us. Good evening and welcome. This sanctuary that you're in right now was built in 19, 1846, mm -hmm. and the congregation goes back 205 years. At one point, we believed that our congregation was part of the Underground Railway, so that we are not new to the idea of social justice. So on behalf of everybody in our church, we welcome you here tonight. And uh, I'd like to say that the church is uh, found as, as, as you're sitting in right now is on Haudenosaunee ground, but I'm not so sure it was because the Haudenosaunee, their land was six miles on the other side of the Grand River, and I think we're outside of that. So that would put us into the Mississauga. I believe that would be their land. Anyways, we're settlers all. But again, welcome to Bartonstone United Church. To, to 
resolve the issue of those who became refugees, Palestinian refugees. The creation of the State of Israel um, created many Palestinian refugees. So that's, in a very nutshell, um, what BDS is. And we're going to be hearing a debate on a portion of this tonight. So I'd like to introduce our two courageous debaters and thank them for uh, their willingness to, to take part in this conversation here in Hamilton tonight. Dimitri Las Laskaras um, sponsored the Green Party motion related to BDS, which passed in August. He is um, the former Green Party justice critic. He's a class action lawyer on the environment and human rights. And we welcome him. Jones, who is from here in Hamilton. In the last federal election, she ran for the Green Party in Hamilton Center as a candidate. Her background is in journalism. She's a graduate of the radio and TV broadcasting program at Madison <coughs> University. She um, has spent some time in marketing. She has been a teacher at Georgian College. She um, has has worked on campaigns and as office manager in, in campaigns for the Green Party. She ran herself in Simco in the town of Midland for min in municipal politics and was the candidate uh, in the most recent election. So we welcome Uda tonight. <laughs> so we're going to be um, debating tonight the BDS motion resolution that passed, uh, passed at the Green Party Canada Convention. And I'm going to, I think, I'm going to allow um, Dimitri to let us know exactly what that is. Um, the de format of the debate, um, each person will have 10 minutes to speak in an opening way. So beginning with the pro, Side, Dimitri and then Uda, and then they have uh, five minutes to go back and forth. Like Dimitri has five minutes to rebut what Uda said. Uda has five minutes to rebut. Dimitri, we can do that again if it seems appropriate, <coughs> and then we'll open it up for questions from the floor. We'll have about 45, 15 minutes uh, for questions from the floor and discussion. And then each person can close, make a closing statement beginning with Uta and ending with the And then we'll have uh, thanks and closing and a few announcements. Yeah. All right. So without further ado, let's begin. <coughs> Thank you all for uh, coming this evening. Um, I just have to commend the United Church. It's such a wonderful organization. <coughs> Everywhere I've gone. Just uh, move the other way. What should I do? Move the microphone. That way? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've now done about 10 town halls and debates. This might be 11, uh, stretching from Montreal to Victoria. Many, many communities along the way, the United Church played a very constructive role in helping us to have these discussions, and I can't remember enough for doing that. Thank you. Yeah. 
Can someone help who is part of to turn that off? It's not providing feedback now, so. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Did you turn it off? I didn't turn this off. Hello? Okay, there we go. <laughs> Right. So, uh, let me start by just summarizing the resolution for you. Uh, the resolution, you've heard that there were three objectives to the BDS movement, and those three objectives are the right of return of Palestinian refugees, uh, an end to the occupation of Arab lands, which includes not only the Palestinian territories, namely Gaza, uh, East Jerusalem, and the West Bank, but also the Golan Heights, which is Syrian territory. That's the second objective. And the third objective is full equality for Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel itself. Our resolution doesn't deal with the right of return of Palestinian refugees. It doesn't address it at all. And it doesn't address the uh, full, full equality of Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel. It only deals with the occupation and the settlements, and specifically the, the Palestinian territory. So it doesn't address the Golan Heights. And for that reason, it's important to understand that this is a very narrow uh, resolution. It's confined to the settlements and the occupation. It is not, contrary to what many of you will have heard, a, an endorsement of the movement. Uh, but we'll, I'm sure we'll have more to say that uh, momentarily. Now, in order to understand uh, whether this is a good policy, whether our party uh, should be behind this resolution, it's really important to understand what is happening on the ground in the Palestinian territories. And you often will hear this described as a conflict, a conflict between the state of Israel and the people of Palestine. Now, of course that's true. In the broadest sense, it is certainly a conflict, but the word conflict doesn't convey any information about the relative power of each side. And when one examines the facts on the ground, one is led inexorably to the conclusion that there is, in fact, a massive disparity of power. Now, why do I say that? Well, first of all, let's deal with the most obvious, and, 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 and I'm sorry, I should step back, that massive disparity of power and the way in which it's being deployed means that the relationship between the Palestinian people and that of the state of Israel is one of oppressed to oppressor. Very important to understand that. And why do I say that? Well, the most obvious reason is that the state of Israel and its population have had a sovereign state for almost 70 years. But during that period, the Palestinian people have not enjoyed any sovereignty whatsoever. And in fact, their sovereignty has diminished over time to the extent that they had any at all. And they're equally deserving under international law of self-determination, just as much as the population of Israel itself. They've not only had to deal with an absence of sovereignty and all of that entails, but they've had, in fact, had to suffer a brutal occupation. And that has lasted for nearly 50 years. Furthermore, the prosperity of the Israeli population is far, in, far ahead of that enjoyed by the Palestinian population. In fact, it's fair to say when one looks at the economic conditions on the ground that the Palestinian people are enduring relative poverty. In 2014, Gaza's unemployment rate achieved a world record, a world record of 47%. You know, we think about depression era levels of unemployment as being devastating, 25%. This was double the depression era levels of unemployment we saw in the Western world. By comparison, the West Bank population lives in relative opulence at 18%. In this country, we would consider an 18% unemployment rate to be devastating. Uh, in the West Bank, that's relatively prosperous compared to Gaza. In August of 2016, by contrast, the unemployment rate in Israel was 4.6%. So significantly lower than it is in this country, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Now, interestingly, Israel I'm sorry, Israel uh, has the lowest unemployment rate, uh, the highest rate of poverty, I should say, in the OECD at about 21%. But the poverty in uh, Palestinian, in Israel itself falls disproportionately on the Palestinian people. Uh, 36 out of 40 uh, of, the high, of the towns having the highest level of unemployment in Israel itself are Arab towns. And the employment rate for the Arab population in Israel is approximately two thirds of the employment rate for the uh, Jewish population in Israel. So again, it's very clear that destitution has been visited upon the Palestinian people and the two 
standards of living that the two populations enjoy is grossly disparate. Uh, in, a, in addition, uh, we know that the uh, Palestinian people, their right of movement is highly restricted, whereas uh, the Jewish population of Israel can come and go freely. Uh, and Beth Selim in 2013, a well-respected Israeli human rights organization, did an analysis of the conditions in the West Bank and found the 387 fixed and surprise checkpoints were in place in the West Bank at that time. It stated that Israel prevents Palestinians from traveling between the West Bank and Gaza in almost all cases. Israel makes it very difficult for West Bank Palestinians to travel abroad. Settlers, by contrast, travel freely along the West Bank's main roads and highways and in and out of the West Bank, while Palestinians are shunted to longer routes using side roads. And freedom of movement, this is something guaranteed to the Palestinian people and to all peoples by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, of course, we should all agree that there is massive disparity in the military power enjoyed by the two sides. Israel has the Middle East's only nuclear arsenal and refuses to accede to the non-proliferation treaty. Its conventional weapons include advanced fighters and bombers, drones, tanks, a missile defense system, advanced attack helicopters, cruise missiles. They also have submarines, a navy, whereas Hamas, uh, the principal belligerent in the conflict, uh, with the Israelis, possesses crude, notoriously inaccurate rockets that Israel-Palestine scholar Norman Finkelstein describes as glorified fireworks. And as one would expect in conditions of such enormous disparity of military power, the casualties on the Palestinian side are far greater. In Israel's last three assaults on Gaza, nearly 4,000 Palestinians were killed, whereas 90 Israelis were killed. Of the 90 Israelis killed, 70 were soldiers, of whom four were killed by friendly fire. And of the almost 4,000 Palestinians, Palestinians killed, over 550 were children. The number of Palestinian children killed in those assaults was more than five times the number of Israeli soldiers that were killed in those conflicts. In Israel's last assault in 2014, nearly 3,400 Palestinian children were wounded, of whom over 1,000 were left permanently disabled. Now imagine an economy that's as devastated as that of Gaza having to care for those children. The means to do so is simply not present. In these three assaults on Gaza, which the Israeli military obscenely refers to as mowing the lawn, the overall ratio of Palestinian dead to Israeli dead was approximately 40 to 1. Those numbers belie any suggestion. It should be clear that the Palestinian people are the aggressors in this conflict. There's simply no doubt from a legal perspective that the settlements which have been expanding relentlessly are a violation of international law. This was so held unanimously by the International Court of Justice in 2004, over a decade ago. And in fact, with the, occurrence, the concurrence of the United States judge on the ICJ, multiple Security Council resolutions agreed to by the United States so declared. Canada, the US, and the EU have all acknowledged that the settlements violate the Fourth Geneva Convention. And our country, as a high contracting party to the Fourth Geneva Convention, has an obligation under Article I, not only to respect the convention itself, but to ensure that it is respected by others in, quote, all circumstances. So when our country fails to take steps, for example, peaceful economic and political sanctions, to induce Israel to respect the Fourth Geneva Convention, our country is itself violating the Fourth Geneva Convention. Now, we have a policy in our party, as does our government, as does virtually every government of the West, favoring a two-state solution. If we don't take steps, however, to prevent the expansion of the settlements and to encourage their dismantling, there will be no two-state solution. And in fact, many today say that the settlements have become so expansive, so extensive throughout the West Bank, that practically speaking, there is no more possibility of a viable Palestinian state along the 1967 borders. So by failing to take action, we are violating our own policy as a party of encouraging and promoting the two-state solution. We have an obligation under our own policy favoring a two-state solution to adopt policies which will promote that outcome. What is Amnesty International, one of the most, if not the most, reputable human rights organizations in the world, have to say about the condition of the Palestinian people? In its most recent report, it stated, quote, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Israeli forces committed unlawful killings of Palestinian civilians, including children. Israeli military police and security forces, quote, tortured and otherwise ill-treated 
Palestinian det detainees, including children, particularly during arrest and detention. So our government is giving unequivocal support to a state that is torturing children. On numerous occasions, journalists covering protests and other developments in the West Bank were assaulted or shot by Israeli police and military forces. And Amnesty goes on to state, in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, Israeli forces demolished at least 510 Palestinian homes and other structures built without Israeli permits, which are virtually impossible to obtain. So in their own homeland, the Palestinian people need permission of, external, of an external occupier to build on their land. It's almost impossible to obtain that permission, and if they defy the external power, they can anticipate that their home will be demolished. Finally, Amnesty states, Israel forces maintained their land, sea, and air blockade of Gaza in force since 2007, imposing collective punishment on the territory's 1.8 million inhabitants. Collective punishment, I assure you, is a violation of Article 33 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, and I hope we can all agree that it just offends our most basic sense of human decency. To punish people for offenses for which they have no responsibility is profoundly unjust. And so Israel's violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention are not confined to the settlements. Collective punishment is a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Torture is a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Unlawful killings of civilians is a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. And I'll conclude my opening statement here if I can have your indulgence. Our, our policy, our vision green, which some in our party describes as a marketing, marketing document, contains this statement. The Green Party of Canada believes that any effort aimed only at one side in this conflict will not end the violent responses that exacerbate human suffering. And in fact, we're being urged as a party to adopt a posture of neutrality with respect to the plight of the Palestinian people. I think that this is profoundly misguided. And I much prefer the statement of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who said, I have witnessed the systemic humiliation of Palestinian men, women, and children. Their humiliation is familiar to all black South Africans. In South Africa, we could not have achieved our democracy without the help of people around the world who through the use of nonviolent means such as boycotts and divestment encourage their governments and other corporate actors to reverse decades long support for the apartheid regime. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. <laughs> Neutrality in these circumstances is a masquerade, my friends. We must side with the oppressor if we are going to do justice to the Palestinians. for agreeing to do this debate. Thank you to the Barton Stone United Church for hosting this event. I am going to come to this from a very unique background because I'm not a lawyer and I'm new to political conventions. So because my training is in media communications and I'm also an emotional health practitioner, I'm gonna take you on a journey and try to tell a little bit of story, a bit of a story of what took place at the convention in, uh, in August with the Green Party. Um, I also was in the workshop room which, uh, where we were working on this issue. So, so um, one of the things you need to know first is that we have an online voting system. So uh, motions are presented to Green Party candidates, or Green Party members, sorry. Um, in an online process to vote on uh, those motions that will be uh, handled for the next two years. And um, we vote in one of three ways. We vote yes, we vote no, and we vote needs further discussion. And on that online system, you can also mail in those votes. So not everybody's comfortable with using uh, digital technology yet, so we have that option as well. Um, at that time, 
we agreed that consensus, which is 60% of the, the, the vote, either moving the motion forward or, or sending the motion, was how we would approach that situation. So if it didn't achieve 60% consensus on a yes or a no, it was going to go to convention. At convention, a decision was made to not use consensus but Robert's rules instead. And I'm learning about all of this as we go along. This is new. I arrived there, very big place, with a lot of people, and I'm trying to learn as quickly as I can. Remember your first day of high school? How confusing that was? That's what it was like for me, and I think just about everybody who had never been there before, and that means all of us. Somehow that decision to, to not use consensus was over, to use consensus was overruled. To me, there is an inconsistency right there. How could we use consensus on our digital voting and then change to Robert's rules, which means 51% of the room <coughs> votes and, and achieves, achieves a motion, either a yay or a nay. The other thing that I brought to this convention that I'd never been at a convention before, but I had been involved with the Green Party up in North Simcoe, and my mentor, who's the CEO of the riding up there, told me, when you go to convention, Uta, you are going to be given three slips of paper. You're going to be given a red piece. You're going to be given a green piece. And you're going to be given a yellow piece. At this convention, I was only given a red piece and a green piece. So at, as on our voting, on our digital voting, the red meant no, the green meant go, and the yellow meant this is going to need some more work so that we can really understand what we're talking about. So I want you to see there's some inconsistencies that took place, and that's why we are challenging this motion. We are not against learning how to help our world be a better place. We are trying to understand how we have to be consistent in our approach to doing that. I did not feel that there was enough time to learn everything I needed to learn about BDS in that situation. In the workshop room, uh, on the convention floor, we were not able to achieve a consensus. We were to go to workshop and learn more about the situation, and I did not feel competent to, to, to be voting on something I didn't understand completely. It was very chaotic in the room. Um, we were told that everyone had two minutes to speak, and some people violated that two minutes. Some people complained about the two minutes so loudly that other people didn't get a chance to speak. There was chaos in that room, and I don't know, that's not why I joined the Green Party. I believe that I joined the Green Party because we respect each other's turn, and we respect each other's participation. To me, climate change is an umbrella issue under which all other Green Party policies fall. It's the perspective from which we should judge all of our value statements. With climate-triggered economic change for decades, um, immigration has redistributed our population such that there are people in every global community from all over the world. Making a decision on this to just affect Israel is not just going to affect Israel. It's going to affect the, the internalization of immigrants in our own community who identify as Jewish or identify as Palestinian. And I'm very concerned about the kinds of conflicts that may bring about in our very own communities. So I want to have that question answered and debated and talked about so I can feel better about it when I vote on those issues. I'm not a lawyer, so the way I understand the world is quite different. At convention, Potential voters on motions have a variety of emotional, psychological, and intellectual intelligences. All are valid, all are necessary. We are teachers, we are mothers, we are 
we are plumbers and, and mechanics and tool and die makers and child care providers. We're all of those things. Not all of us come with an understanding of the law as Dimitri has it. So we're doing our very best, but our vote counts as well. The BDS measures in South Africa began in the 1970s. That's almost 50 years ago, and much has changed since this from the media's perspective. How news was gathered in this era is very different than how news is gathered today. Coverage and documentation was a privilege in the 1970s, and I believe very influenced by the government's goals at that time. That's not so different today in mainstream media. The news you see is controlled by governments. And, their, and the governments and their corporate investors. In the 1970s, books and periodicals were chosen to be published through application processes. Few people had access to the resources necessary to publicly publish anything. Today, I can write a blog or shoot a video on a very small handheld device called a cell phone, and within four days, I can have almost 2,000 views in social media. And that viewage is random. It's not controlled access. What makes the news today on social media is momentum triggered rather than corporately dictated. Random access news. I look at the, the coverage of this event and I think about other significant incidences in the world. 9-11, our recent flooding in Louisiana. In 9-11, we were it was the first time we were exposed to live streaming. Many of us, for the first time ever, saw those towers hit. While they were being hit, many of us saw video footage afterwards, but some of us were in stores, many places. That's a new concept, live stream, and it has an effect on our perceptions. During the New Orleans, or sorry, the, the Louisiana flooding, live stream was also an issue. How did I find out about the flooding in Louisiana? I found out about it on social media because I don't have a television and I don't watch mainstream media. Then I googled the story. I watched one mainstream coverage of that issue and then I YouTubed a blogger who was actually going through the event at the time. Well, then I googled another event, a local news coverage of that event, and heard what the local sheriff had to say about it. And then I followed that blogger for a week to see what he was going through. It was very interesting. I'm trying to try explain how, how it's different now than it was then, and we need to really address that <coughs> issue before we can fully sign on to this motion. We need to get the words right so that the word's correct, so that we all understand this is not the 1970s, this is 2016, and how we do things in this world is very different. Our technology has changed, and our technology has changed us. We are not the same people that we were then. Our bodies are structured different. I was telling someone today, we read faster than human beings ever read before because of computers, and we need to have that as part of the conversation. This is what, what I bring to the story. It is a very different perspective, and thank you for letting me share it. The point is here. Lights on in the parking lot. ASKE 188. It's a BMW. <laughs> <laughs> it's your car. Okay, <laughs> All right, thank you. Now we have uh, five minutes each to respond to the um, 
opening up speeches. Um, I, I, I seem to be having the same experience over and over again when I debate this uh, this issue. Uh, I debated John Luke Cook, the shadow cabinet member, who's taking the lead in seeking the repeal of the BDS resolution in Ottawa. And after his presentation, I went first and made a very similar presentation. I started my rebuttal exactly as I'm going to start it today because it has to be said. UTA did not dispute one of the human rights violations that I identified. These egregious, severe human rights violations. Even Elizabeth May herself, standing on the convention floor at the critical moment, was not prepared to dispute the human rights violations that I had cataloged before the plenary. And the simple proposition we're here to ask ourselves is, in the face of such human rights violations, do the values of our party oblige us to withdraw political and economic support for those who are profiting from those violations? That's the simple proposition. And every time I debate somebody about this, whether in a formal setting or informal, they want to move the discussion to the process. And they avoid the key question, what are we going to do about these human rights violations? How long do the Palestinian people have to endure what they have endured? Gaza is on the, on the verge of becoming unlivable. 1.8 million people are trapped in an open-air prison, to use the words of David Cameron, the British Prime Minister. What are we going to do to help them? How long do we have to talk about doing something? That's the issue. And with the greatest of respect, neither Uta, nor Jean-Luc Cook, nor Elizabeth May has answered that question, the key question. But I will talk about the process. First of all, there's a lot of confusion in the discussion about the process. What is consensus? From my understanding of consensus, I don't report to be an expert, uh, is that it's essentially something from which there is general agreement. No one is prepared to stand up and say, no, I object to this. There's general agreement. Not 60% agreement, not 50%, but basically everybody in the room accedes to the resolution being put forward for consideration. Now, Elizabeth May has said, we didn't have consensus on this issue. Well, that's true, we didn't have consensus on this issue. But the green rules, which Elizabeth May has consistently invoked as being the model that we ought to have employed, actually don't use the word consensus. You can see them yourself on the website of the Green Party of Canada. And in fact, Article 3, which lays out the process that we are required to go through in order to consider whether to adopt a resolution, the very last clause, Clause M, and Uta alluded to this, explicitly contemplates that if you can't get agreement, there will be a vote. And 60% is the threshold. And therefore, a supermajority has the constitutional ability to impose its will on the minority. That is what the rules have always contemplated. And that's essentially what happened here. Now, it's true that we went to something different, Robert's Rules. But in fact, Robert's Rules are not dramatically different from the Green Rules, if you look at the rules and actually read what the Green Rules say. But this has often not been said. I was there when we talked at the outset of the convention about whether to use Robert's Rules. And although Elizabeth May originally raised a concern about them, when she was assured by the party president, Ken Melamed, that he was familiar and comfortable with Robert's Rules, she herself voted to use them. So now she's complaining about the use of Robert's Rules after having voted before the entire plenary to use the very rules about which she's complaining. And I ask this question. If she had lost, if she had won the debate, would we really be having this whole discussion about another meeting in December? No. Would we be complaining about the absence of consensus if the absence of consensus had resulted in the defeat of the BDS resolution? I think merely to ask that question is to know the answer. This is not about the absence of consensus. This is about our leader, with all due respect, having lost an extensive debate, not, not a, an abbreviated debate. We were attacked by the media for months before the convention. This generated a great deal of discussion at the highest levels in our party about this resolution in which I participated, many participated. It precipitated a discussion at the level of the grassroots. This was the most heavily debated resolution uh, at the convention. I don't agree that the workshop was chaotic. What I, what I saw happen in that workshop was that there were a lot of people who were unhappy with the position being taken by our party's leader. They felt it was indefensible. And that's what happened in the plenary. They felt it was indefensible. And ultimately, that earned her some uh, a reaction, a negative reaction, regrettably. Now, I don't support her having been booed by a couple of people, but fundamentally, the ill will in the room emanated from the fact that the people who support BDS could not understand why our party's leader was trying to defeat this resolution. It wasn't about the process. It was about the substance of her position.
Now, it is said that climate change is an umbrella issue. Well, if you look at the issues of our party, we actually have six core values in the Constitution. One of them relates to sustainability, and another one relates to the preservation of, of the ecology, I'm paraphrasing. But there are four of the six values which say nothing about the environment. They are social justice, participatory democracy, uh, uh, non-violence, and respect for diversity. These are fundamentally human rights values. We are constitutionally mandated to protect human rights in our party. We are not a one-trick pony, and as long as we continue to perpetuate the per perception amongst the electorate that we are a one-trick pony and we only care about climate change, we are never going to make strides. We have to demonstrate that we are about much more. And by the way, the issues of human rights and climate justice are intimately intertwined. That's something that as Green Party members we should all know. So this policy is not just the right thing to do, which seems to me to be absolutely clear. It is not simply mandated by our values, which seems to me to be absolutely clear, but it's actually smart politics. And if our leader would get behind the policy, I think we would see, and we're already seeing it, even with our opposition, a massive movement of people from the progressive part of this population, which is millions of Canadians around the country, who have been abandoned by the political elite, you'll see them come to our party in droves, and we'll do something that we failed to do for something like 30 years, which is to really make our presence felt in the Parliament of Canada. <coughs> I hope you are all learning so much because that's what we're here to do. We're here to learn and grow and do better. Climate change is not only an environmental word. In my mind, when I hear climate change, I also think it applies to human rights. That's why I refer to it as a climate is how everything is meant. In every, anyway, I swear. <laughs> And also, Elizabeth May is not the Green Party. She is one member of the Green Party. The Green Party is every single individual who pays their $10 a year to be a member for that party. We all have equal rights and privileges. Even the council doesn't get more than one vote in the Green Party. And we are all unique individuals. We understand written words differently. I can put a sentence on the, on the wall, and based on your personal experience in life, how you've grown up, what kind of parents you had, what kind of school you went to, what country you lived in, you're going to have a very different feeling about that sentence than I do. And that's important that we all have bring those differences to the table, that those feelings get expressed. Because otherwise, we're not going to be able to achieve consensus on what it is we're trying to accomplish with emotion. Not all of us are lawyers. That is, that is an important person that needs to be you know, represented. And it, and that, that stream, that thought stream, that skill set, that's part of what needs to be in the Green Party. But we need plumbers and electricians and babysitters and uh, artists. We need us all at the table and we all need to be able to understand the words that go into our our political movements, our political statements. If we don't become citizen engaged across the board, we're just going to keep handing over our our privileges and our, and our we're, we're just going to keep handing it over to people who we think are in charge. I'm telling you, nobody's in charge of Canada. We are all part of Canada, and we all have a responsibility to be. We all have a responsibility to be Canada's Prime Minister. We all have a responsibility to act like we think the Prime Minister of our country should act. And that's our job, to do that. To be the, the words, to be the presence. We can't scapegoat politicians. We can't say, well, she did this and he did that. I know how I voted that day. And I voted, I don't understand enough. I need some more information. And I'm proud to stand up and tell you that's how I voted. I was there. I did see something very different than Dimitri did in the room. As you can see, two different perspectives, both valid, and both need to be presented. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Let's um, take some questions. Thank you. 
Well, I'm Henry Evans, Henry. Uh, I'm Hamilton here. I'm not a member of the Green Party, but uh, I, I speak as one who has been to Palestine as a human rights observer. I witnessed firsthand the human rights abuses. And, and this is not a debate about politics, it's a debate about human rights. I have seen, I stood beside an Israeli soldier as he pointed his rifle at a group of children aged 5 to, to 15 and, and claimed that they had thrown rocks and started firing live rounds at these children. I was at a peaceful demonstration outside of Jerusalem where there was absolutely no violence on the part of the uh, Palestinians and, and the, the IDF occupiers still opened up on us with live rounds. I actually had a bullet grazed my ear and a fellow standing next to me was hit in the head and died at our feet. So I've, I've seen the human rights abuses. And what's, what wasn't mentioned at the beginning too was these settlements are not only a violation of, of um, Palestinian land, these settlements are set up so that they control the water ex access to the Palestinians. Many of these settlements are set up on aquifers. Um, and and uh, well, the Israelis have green lawns and swimming pools. Palestinians have very limited access to water both in, in, in the West Bank and in Gaza. And also, what was mentioned, the United Nations itself said by 2020, Gaza will be uninhabitable. That's three years. Three years. Do you have a question? And, and so I'm, I'm just wondering how, how um, we cannot support BDS. Um, my own government bill that applies me wants to condemn me for taking a peaceful means of action. So how can we not support BDS? May I respond? Yes, I think that's what we're doing. So I can only go with my first intuitive response to that, and I'm very sorry that you had that experience. It must have been horrible for you. Don't be sorry for me. Be sorry for the Palestinian people. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. I wanted to show a video tonight, but we didn't have access to Wi-Fi that was sent to me by someone who knew that I was going to have this talk tonight. It, it is a beautiful video showing women in Israel walking, Jewish women beside Palestinian women, walking for peace. I'm very concerned that when we introduce the BDS movement without examining all of what it entails, for the modern era. Excuse me. For the what, modern what, era. What's, what does that have to do with my Can I finish what I'm saying? <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm very concerned that it's going to have an effect on those women too. And we have to talk about those implications as well. I'm not prepared myself as a member of the Green Party to vote for the motion in its current format because of what I've told you today. I don't know what else to tell you that, that can make that better for you. I, I don't know, because I can't, I, I want to be a part of the solution, but I need to know more about how it's going to be implemented before I can exactly. sign on to that, okay? Shame, shame. It's okay. No, no. Let's, let's be respectful. Be respectful. Thank you. No respect. Um, but no, I, I think the best way we're going to, uh, you know, bring about understanding is by being respectful. I think that's very important, especially. In the <laughs> and, uh, I certainly understand, you know, people's feelings around this issue because what's happening is so terrible. Um, you know, in, in our party, there are people who is not alone who says, you, "You say, you know, I need to know more." Uh, I wonder how many of those people have read Amnesty International's most recent report on the conditions in Palestine. I wonder how many of those people have read the Gore Guardian's report in 2009 where it identified war crimes in Gaza and said it found evidence that Israeli soldiers were using children, Palestinian children, as human shields. I wonder how many of them have read statements from the government, like the Deputy Defense Minister last year who said that Palestinian people are animals and aren't human, his exact words. It's curious to me that so many people in our party say they need more knowledge, and it's 
sitting there, it's readily available to them. But they much more they're much more interested in discussing procedural issues than looking at the horrors being inflicted on the Palestinian people on a, on a daily basis. <laughs>
You need to get educated. That's what you need to do. And you can share that information with other Green Party members. Uh, there are, in fact, such notes, hundreds of notes that have been delivered to our party's leaders. I know this because I was copying on these notes. There are people all across Canada, people who come from other parties, not just members of our own party, who have written to Elizabeth May, who have written to me, who have written to Ken Melvin, the party president, and they think that this is wonderful. And they think it's high time that the other parties join us. And they describe this as an act of courage, and numerous of them express disappointment in the fact that our leader does not support this morally courageous act. And this minimalist act from the standpoint of human decency really is minimal. So the voices are there. They've spoken. Um, the difficulty we have is that we have a leadership. I'm sorry to keep coming back to this, but our leader has made this about her, and we're now forced to discuss that. We have a leadership who doesn't want to acknowledge the existence of these voices. You can go check for yourself on the internet that Elizabeth May has been quoted dozens of times in the media over the last four months talking about this BDS policies, and all she ever says when she talks about the public's reaction is that it's negative. She never says that there are any voices out there supporting what our party has done, but I assure you they are there. The problem is that they're not being listened to. Shame. Hello, I would like to thank the board of uh, and the moderator, of course. Can you stand closer to the microphone, please? Can you hear me now? Is the microphone working? Closer still. Closer still. I don't think it's on. Closer. He's not an immigrant, he's an indigenous person in there. 
So what I'm trying to say to you is that I think you should hit the books, never mind the media. The media is owned, every media in, the, in the North America is owned by six companies. Mm -hmm. They're not giving us news, they're programming us. So I think that you should look at the problem rather than not the procedure. This procedure, Robert Trude of orders and all this stuff, doesn't mean anything. Listen to the principles. And that man was talking sense. Procedures is nonsense. Thank That was also my first convention. 
I didn't go there, I'm a lawyer, but I had never read Robert's rules before. I had never read the rules of procedure of the Green Party until like 24 hours before we actually went into the plenary. I had to inform myself on short notice. And since then, I've looked at them again and again and again, and I cannot see a single violation of any procedure anywhere. Okay? The, the resolution, which just says, you know, if we needed it to be reworded. There was a debate about this in the workshop. There was an attempt to, quote, unquote, re re rework the resolution. What it was was a gutting of the resolution. And in fact, our bylaws state explicitly that any modification that occurs in the workshop must be consistent with the original intent. And when that gutting of the resolution was put up on the screen in the workshop, I asked for a ruling from the facilitator about whether it was consistent with the original intent. It wasn't my decision. Who just says that I refused? I made an argument. I made an argument that the gutting of the resolution violated the original intent, and the facilitator agreed with me. This is exactly what the rules of our party provide for. And so the resolution, which is very clear, very simple, no complex language in there, you can read it for yourself, emerged in accordance with the rules from the workshop, unmodified. There was another attempt made on the convention floor uh, to violate or to, to alter the resolution. Again, it was a judge not to be in accordance with the original intent, in accordance with the rules, and a vote was called in accordance with the rules. Everything was done in accordance with the rules. All the claims that the process wasn't followed, I regret to say, are a smokescreen. They're a smokescreen. The problem is that our leader lost. It's not that the process wasn't followed.
Sure. Ask a question and make a comment. I got a question. Uh, Vince Garrido off the Green Party candidate in Burlington. Um, oops. Um, yeah, I'm not anti anybody. I'm pro uh, freedom and justice, and I'm not on the side of any of the belligerents or the uh, war criminals that are involved on um, either side. Okay, so um, that's where I'm coming from. But I do have, I was at the policy convention, I was there, and I saw what happened. And uh, we passed uh, dozens of uh, policies, some by a supermajority. Some that were so close that we had to count the individual votes, and some that were refused. So if this is truly about policy, then how come, I'm sorry, if this is truly about procedure, then how come this is the only policy which is being debated? And this one, by the way, was passed by a supermajority. Why aren't we also, if this is about procedure, then why aren't we also debating the policies that passed by a very slim majority, by 50% plus one? Okay, why, why are those policies not being revisited? Why is it just this one? So I'm asking you, if this is truly about policy, that should we be revisiting every single policy that we passed at that convention? Why is it just this one? So that's my question. I'm not going to answer Vince's question because when I arrived here this evening, Vince sat beside me and told me he is putting forward a motion to, he's contacting people to have my membership revoked from the Green Party. So he didn't give me any respect by doing that just before I came up to sit on the panel. Politics isn't personal. He asked a really good question to get answers. If you don't want to answer it, then Dimitri can answer it. I, I think Vince is going to know what my answer is. There's no explanation whatsoever for that fact. And this goes back to what I've been saying, and I don't want to harp on it. But the procedural arguments, the lack of consensus objection, is a smokescreen. It's a smokescreen. Yes. We're doing this because we have somebody at the top of our organization who doesn't want this party to support BDS for whatever reasons. I can't read Elizabeth May's mind. Only she knows why. But she doesn't want this resolution to stand. And we haven't talked about this. This is very important. The decision to hold another meeting in December was held with the threat of resignation of our leader hanging over the heads of the members. And in my view, that's not appropriate. And I'll give you the example of David Cameron, who recently lost the Brexit vote. And we all know what David Cameron did. I'm no fan of David Cameron. But David Cameron, to his credit, after having argued vociferously for the United Kingdom remaining within the European Union, immediately went up to the podium the day after he lost the Brexit vote and announced his resignation. He, in good conscience, could not remain as the Prime Minister after having lost that vote. Now, if our leader or any leader, not just our leader, can in good conscience support a policy like this, although frankly I find it incomprehensible why anybody could not support this policy, especially in a party that has the values that we have, the option available to that leader is either to simply accept the will of the members or to leave the position of leader. I never wanted that to happen. I didn't think that that would be the outcome of all of this, but that's the option. But to say, you know, imagine David Cameron going up to the to microphone after the Brexit vote and saying, you silly Brits, you know, you really did something stupid here. You shouldn't have voted for Brexit, so I'm now going to threaten to resign and we're going to hold another referendum in three months. He would have been a laughing stock. Nobody would have stood for that. That would have been viewed as a subversion of the democracy, the democratic process in the United Kingdom. It's no different in our party. We shouldn't have to go back and have this debate over again, this extensive debate, which followed meticulously the applicable rules, just because one person in our party happens to be unhappy with the outcome. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Palestine, walking with a Palestinian woman and an Israeli woman or a Palestinian or a Jewish people walking together. It's not a peaceful movement to stop the, government, the Israeli government violation. We need a solid movement, and I want to hear from you what's your alternative. Responses. I did educate myself. I've gotten a lot of information on this issue from both sides. That's my right as a, as a person who's going to vote on an issue, is to find out both sides of the issue. And the issue in this case was, do we pass a motion that is worded the way it is? You said, sorry, you said you... you it's not about BBS. You didn't vote because you didn't have... The, no, I voted. I have information. I voted for the motion to be reworded. That is what I voted for. But you got a consensus set. I voted for the vote. And, and to say that only one person voted for the motion to be reworded, reworded is incorrect. No such vote was held. There were only two choices, for and against, once you got to the convention. No. That is, were you at convention? Understanding no, confirmed, there, that is not what the issue was. It was do you do you do you support the motion in its current form? And I did not support the motion in its current form. That was your vote. That was my vote. Yes, and the motion passed. Right. In its current form. Under Robert's rules. Under the rules of the party. Under Robert's rules, and we would like consensus to be the rules of the party. Who's Those of us that voted against the promotion in its current form. I'm a member of the Green Party. You don't speak for me. So don't say me when you're referring to your personal position on this matter. Were you at convention? We it needed your vote. Did you vote? Okay. Okay, the second question. Okay, what's your alternative? Okay, sorry. The second question is: What's the alternative way, in your opinion, to stop the Israeli violation if the BDS is not the effective way? It's all or copy from South Africa. I never said that BDS was not the effective way. I said I didn't think the wording of the motion was the correct way. I don't know why people you say, are understanding. You say we are in 2016 and the BDS. Copy from South African I was, movement. I wish it happened in the 70s, and we did not know what happened in the 70s because the vote is not. I'm saying understand that that's also a perspective that that further that further enlightens this discussion. I'm telling you that I'm not saying BDS is wrong or not the solution. I'm saying I did not vote for the motion in its current wording. That's what I've said over and over what again. What do you want? Okay, the other question is okay. What, what do you want? want there is a proposal on the floor, and there have there, and we'd like to see to more. To reword it as a to 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 reword or to reframe the BDS as a movement. Or no, to reword the motion, and I don't have it in front of me right now. I'm very sorry. I my, I don't have access to the internet, which is where I would normally I would just Google things for you as quickly as I can, but I, I don't have that in this building. I
in July at my own expense in order to meet with Elizabeth May and her chief of staff in order to try to find a compromise resolution. I put one to her, which was a very significant watering down, and I did that frankly because I thought without the leader's support we were going to lose. So I was trying to salvage something from the situation. She did not accept that, that resolution. We continued to have discussion for weeks on end. We get to the plenary, and suddenly they flash up on the screen a compromise resolution that I've never seen before. They sandbagged us. They didn't even give us the courtesy of allowing us to see that resolution before it was put up on the screen. But I have a pretty clear recollection of what it said. And what it basically did was it equated human rights violations by Palestinian groups with human rights violations by Israel. It more or less put them on the same level. It put the Palestinian violations first in terms of order, and then it talked about, at the very end, the Canadian government should maybe think about one day sanctioning these parties, not Israel, but these parties. That's essentially what it said. Okay, and this goes back to the point that I made in the outset. You have to, in order to do justice, you have to stand with the oppressed, and the facts make it abundantly clear who is the oppressed and who is the oppressor. that suggests that there's some sort of equivalency between what the Palestinian people have done and what the State of Israel is doing. Some sort of equivalency between the power enjoyed by the two sides. Nor will I support any resolution that doesn't call unambiguously for the imposition of meaningful sanctions on the State of Israel, because to answer this lady's question, there is no other option. Any law that is not enforced is a dead legend. It's not worth the paper that it's written on. And when it comes to the State of Israel, the Western powers refuse to enforce the law. Until we address that problem, the Palestinian people have no hope, and they will suffer immensely. Yes. Uh, 
Huh? Doubling down. Doubling down the mistake by saying now trying to then get this SGM to try and come up with consensus. Well, I pose that question out there in the Green Party web pages. What is consensus? It is exactly what um, uh, Dimitri had explained, and that's how it is in the Constitution. So consensus, sure, to get 100% agreement, what are the chances? If you can't get 100% agreement, you're going to get majority. And Elizabeth agreed to the Roberts Rules change. So it doesn't matter anymore your position on this. So she's now changed the SGM. Do you know she's again in violation? All that's in violation because it states that we were supposed to get notification 30 days before, is it 30? 30 days before the deadline for submitting a resolution. 30 days before the, uh, submitting, what he said, resolution. <laughs> <laughs> Which would have been September 3rd, 3rd or 4th. Sometime in the early September, we got notification September 23rd, and the deadline was October 4th to submit these new other resolutions, something to dumb it down this one. So that's another major violation in procedure. So I don't want Uta to answer to that. I would like Dimitri to answer if you have anything to add to that or if you're in agreement. Thank you for that. And that, that was a, a, a very important point, which I didn't address in my comments, Aaron. Uh, and Aaron, you've done a, a wonderful job of being a supporter of this resolution. And I know that you're you're doing that, even though you have so much admiration for this and it shows, to my mind, a great deal of integrity, for which I, I, I truly respect everything. So thank you. The 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 uh, just to elaborate on what Aaron was explaining about this last point, the rules of our party and our constitution and bylaws state that before there's a general meeting of the members, and that's what's going to take place in early November, you have to give 30 days notice of a deadline to submit resolutions, and then the deadline must be at least 60 days before the convention. And if you don't respect those rules, then any resolution that is put before the convention must be of an emergency nature, and in order for it to be determined to be of an emergency nature, two-thirds of the people present at the convention have to agree that it's an emergency motion. The notice that was sent to us, much less than 30 days from the deadline for submitting resolutions, clearly implied that if you got your resolutions in by October 4th, then you wouldn't have to meet the two-thirds threshold. This is a very serious res uh, violation of the Constitution and the bylaws. Basically, they've ignored a provision, uh, and by so doing, they've lowered the threshold from two-thirds to try to get the BDS policy repealed or modified to 50%. That's what they've done. Just by flooding the Constitution. So it's a little bit galling, and I don't want to, you know, only teach other people because I'm hearing a lot of this from people who are opposed to the BDS policy. They keep talking about the process, and they're simply not even acknowledging that there have been very serious violations of the procedural requirements subsequent to the Ottawa Convention, which are clearly designed effectively to rig the game and not and count them. Right. That's clearly what's going on. Thank you. So the margin, the, the ratio of yay sayers to naysayers was in excess of four to one. The rest of the voters 
voted yellow, which means that they would like to see the policy improved in some unspecified manner in the workshop, but they're content with the original intent. So the implication of this voting pattern is that in excess of 80% of the few persons who voted were in agreement with the general intent, and most of those people were fine with the exact wording, and some portion of the minority wanted to see the language improved in some way. We then go to the workshop, and as I say, there was an attempt made to gut the resolution which failed, there was a vote. The margin of approval in the workshop, and I think it was a room that was maybe a little smaller than this, and it was full, uh, was so large that there was no hand count requested by anybody. And in fact, when, when the resolution passed and modified, I think it's fair to say that there was a very, very enthusiastic round of applause. And it was a remarkable scene, because you had our leader and Jean-Luc Cook staying there, having argued vociferously uh, for the to be gotten to be watered down, and uh, nonetheless, you know, there was very hearty applause. We then go out onto the convention floor. Now we have, you know, about 250 participants who were all there at the convention, uh, hearing extensive debate. Again, there was a vote, and the margin of victory was so large that there was no count. Okay. By my estimate, and it, admittedly it was just me eyeballing the crowd, it was about two thirds to one third. Certainly, I would say it was over 60%. I, I know who to say that who that was there. And by the way, the, the, the Vice President of the Federal Council, because we had this discussion, Patricia Farnese, you can ask her. Patricia Farnese said very clearly that that's exactly what happened. Ken Melamed, the President of the party, said exactly what's, what's happened. And there's a problem in that some of the people who are opposed to this are confusing two votes, okay? There were two votes related to the BDS policy. One was very close. The two votes, the first vote, was whether or not to separate. There were three clauses in the BDS policy, okay? The, third, the third clause relates to whether or not we are going to uh, condemn efforts to suppress expressions of support for BDS, okay? That's the third clause, I didn't mention that. There was a motion before we got to the vote on the resolution to separate that clause from the other two clauses. That vote was so close that there was a hand count. And some people, disingenuously, have been confusing that vote, and I have to say, some, I'm not saying this about you, but there's some other people, I think they know perfectly well what happened, and they've been claiming that that vote was the vote on the resolution itself. That's not the case. I'm absolutely certain of it. You can ask the party hierarchy. When we got down to voting on the policy itself, the margin was so large that no one requested a hand count, not even Elizabeth May. That's what happened. Let me just check with you. Um, would you like to end at nine? And if so, um, we need to start wrapping up so that we can have a closing statement from each other, from each person. But it's up to you. If you want to take ten more minutes and then, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I see two. I see three people. Four people. Four people. I see three. Oh, she's already spoken. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it's one to the last I can't respond to the last speaker? No. Yeah. Oh, do you? I, I think that there were a lot of people at convention, and Dimitri's listed the, the viewpoint of some people. He's giving you names. Every person there had their perspective of what happened, and they have the right to express their, their viewpoint of what happened, how they saw it. I'm very disappointed that someone would come up to the microphone, very disappointed, and say, I don't want to hear what you have to say on this issue, when I thought this was an equal debate. Apparently, this is not an equal debate when I'm being told to be quiet. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Urquhart, and I'm a Green Party uh, member. I was a candidate in flamborough landbrook in the last election, and I'm also the CEO of the electoral district for the mountain that we're in. Um, so, in principle, and, and the principle we're talking about here is human rights violations, I support this um, policy. And I think you would be in disagreement with me that uh, 
certainly a large majority, if not all of Green Party members, uh, detest human rights violations. So there should be some way for us to get this, uh, some sort of acceptance. As it is right now, we, uh, the policy passed. I was at the convention too, and I also sat in on the um, workshop. And the policy passed. Uh, and there's uh, been quite a bit of upheaval since that time. We had a, um, a wonderful leader who didn't know whether she could continue in the party, and she took some time to think about it. Um, we had the removal of uh, three good members from the shadow cabinet, uh, and there was discussion between uh, provincial leaders and uh, the party. Um, it, it, in, in, in a nutshell, it seems to have uh, divided the party quite a bit. So my question is, um, you know, we're going to, to Calgary in December. Uh, what can we do to find some common ground? You're here. I'm very happy to answer, to answer that question because it is a very important question. Uh, so there has been, a, you know, in advance of this uh, convention, the shadow cabinet uh, put forward a compromise resolution, as they call it. Uh, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see that, day, but it's up. Uh, you can go to the SGM part of the website of the party, and you'll see a list of resolutions. It's the very last one. There are four relating to Palestine and Israel, uh, all pending to this policy. It's the very last one, and it's lengthy. Uh, and I was asked to co-sponsor that policy, uh, even though I'm not in shadow cabinet, and I refused to do that. And I, re I refused to do that because I felt that it didn't contain meaningful sanctions at the end of the day. So uh, nonetheless, I have agreed to go to a meeting with a select member of, uh, select members of the shadow cabinet uh, in Vancouver in a week's time. Uh, I'm going to be joined at that meeting by Lisa Barrett, the international affairs critic, who, like me, was removed uh, from the shadow cabinet for refusing to apologize to BC Green Party leader Andrew Weaver after he quite nastily attacked the BDS policy and its supporters, uh, and we defended ourselves, so we're both agreeing to go to that. Uh, we, in advance of that meeting, have put forward a revision to the policy the shadow cabinet proposed. Uh, you know, the preliminary sense that I have is that there are a good deal, a good many people on the shadow cabinet who can live with our proposed uh, compromise, basically Lisa and me, right? Um, but there are a couple of people uh, on shadow cabinet who I expect are going to be difficult to persuade. Uh, so the question is whether we, in that meeting, it's going to be two days, uh, in a week's time, and in correction, four or five days' time. Uh, can bridge that divide. I think there's a decent chance that we will. Uh, and I, I do want to achieve an outcome, but I'm not going to throw human rights or the Palestinian people under the bus. And at the end of the day, if we can't bridge that divide, you know, uh, I have to say, I think we're headed for a train wreck in Calgary. I, I think it would be a terrible thing for us to go there at uh, And it's just going to have to come down at the end of the day to those two or three people on Shadow Cabinet, you know, deciding that they're going to put human rights first before political experience. Hey, so. <laughs> uh, my name is Matthew Sloan. Um, I kept, uh, throughout this discussion, thinking of a line that has haunted me since I heard it. I keep thinking of a line that has haunted me since I heard it. Who remembers the Armenians? I don't know if anyone knows who spoke that. Of course. Uh, we have discussed uh, the crimes of Israel against the Palestinian people. Um, I would like to also quote another line before I say who spoke the first one. Uh, it's a bit lengthy, but um, I'll try to breeze through it. Uh, it's by Raphael Lemkin, the lawyer who coined the term genocide that we 
that is recognized under international law. Uh, we have a sort of, um, we tend to think of genocide as uh, the mass killing of people. But in fact, Lemkin was very, he coined that term long before World War II. He was thinking of the Armenians, in fact, who suffered a genocide under the Ottoman Empire. Uh, he says, more often, genocide refers to a coordinated plan aimed at destruction of the essential foundations of life of national groups so that these groups wither and die like plants that have suffered a blight. The end may not be accomplished by forced uh, disintegration of political and social institutions, of the culture of the people, or of the language, their national feelings, and their religion. It may be accomplished by wiping out all basis for personal security, liberty, health, and dignity. When these means fail, the machine gun can always be utilized as the last resort. Genocide is directed against a national group as an entity, and the attack on individuals is only secondary to the annihilation of a national group to which they belong. So it's interesting, he could not have foreseen when he um, developed the concept of genocide that years later, Hitler would boast, who remembers the Armenians? Who remembers the Palestinians? And why is the Green Party of Canada a progressive party that considers social justice as equal to environmental Justice. Why are we debating whether we should condemn the destruction of a people that has been going on for 60 years? When Canadians have laws that demonstrate that they have the ability to do what you just said, that they don't kill their own people from leachings, from tar sands. When we do that, then we have the right to tell other people in the world what to do. But right now, we have not cleaned up our own act, and we do not have the right to jump down other people's throats and solve their problems for them. We have to take care of the home front. We have to solve our own issues. We are poisoning First Nations people all over this country. We treat them like second-class citizens. Why, why can't you oppose the, the injustice to others while opposing the injustice because, here? Because my laws are not protecting those people. How can my laws Canada's protect laws, anyone? Canada's laws, in, Canada is a signatory to a number of UN conventions, including the obligation to protect Against crimes against humanity. This is a crime against humanity, and Canadian law obliges us, and obliges us to stand against it, to intervene for the sake of these people. Then make and, and many of the people who, who support Palestinian rights equally support the rights of Canadian Indigenous people, including myself. Yes. Motion condemning Canada for its genocide against Native uh, Indigenous peoples, First Nations, I would support it and I would oppose to my last breath any attempt to gut that resolution. If we don't have that resolution, I will write it with you if you're still a member of the party. And I will write it with you. Let's but do it. don't, but don't, shh, don't flush another people down the toilet. Because on some on the basis of some moral relativism. That is that is that would lead us to do nothing. To do nothing to do that is where your logic leads. No, and it I is a say, fallacy. Can, can, can I can I respond, please? I'm saying let's create a, a policy, a, a, let's put together a motion and a policy that reflects what you just said and what I just said. We have one. Yeah. No, we don't we didn't have to.
the defense of the indigenous Palestinian people and the indigenous peoples of Canada, these are not mutually exclusive goals. They are perfectly achievable together. And in fact, uh, this is a global struggle, the struggle for indigenous rights. And most, the vast majority of the indigenous peoples who are dealing with colonialism and oppression understand this. You know, the, the BDS movement uh, three weeks ago sent a message of solidarity to the indigenous peoples in North Dakota who are fighting against that heinous pipeline. Yes. And, and, but I went to, uh, I was at the World Social Forum and I listened to uh, a panel which included Omar Marruti, a co-founder of the BDS movement, and Ali Hubana, who's the founder of uh, a wonderful new site called Ele Electronic Intifada. And when Ali spoke, he said, you know, he asked everybody in the audience, do you know where the word Bantustan came from? Of course, Bantustan is what the South Africans, the blacks of South Africa had to endure. Bantustan is essentially what the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza are currently enduring. I didn't know this. And he asked everybody, and nobody could guess. He said it came from Canada. The concept of a Bantustan came from Canada. The colonial enterprise is a global enterprise. Resistance to the colonial enterprise is a global movement. And we must join forces. The indigenous peoples and all of, the, all of us who champion indigenous rights must join forces in order to defeat the oppressors. Um, I just uh, wanted to say, uh, a couple of people have already said it, but uh, Dimitri, I really wanted to thank you uh, for putting the motion forward and for going on the road with it. For doing it within the Green Party because it became much more public. Uh, and that led me to, uh, I, I, I too was a, a lifelong MVP, um, lost all respect for them, uh, decided to join the Green Party solely based on finding a political party that takes a stand for human rights and just. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I would, I would caution. I, I don't know what your compromise is going to be, but it's pretty. Your your motion's pretty weak as it is. Uh, compromising it any further, if you were hoping to get people like myself, uh, we'll call it progressive wing of the NDP, to come over to the Green Party, if you water down the motion, you'll lose us just as quickly as you got us. And if people like Udi take over the party, you'll lose us for sure. <laughs>
Uh, I'm going to finish by asking a question, which is a very difficult question for me to ask, but it must be asked. And I'll start by talking about the media's reaction to all of this. The media has condemned our party, the mainstream media, not the independent media, it's been a very different reaction. And they've talked about the divisions in our party, and they've talked about us unfairly singling out Israel, even though two years earlier we adopted a resolution calling for an arms embargo on Saudi Arabia, and nobody said at that time that we were unfairly singling out the Saudis, or that we were Islamophobes, or anti-Arab, not a word. You know, the, the, fun, the fundamental problem, I think, in terms of dealing with this issue, is that there are people in our country, this is the unpleasant part of what I have to say, for whom Palestinian lives don't matter as much as the lives of Christians and Jews, white Anglo-Saxons, peoples of European descent. You know, bigotry and racism falls along a spectrum. There are the obvious cases, the cases we all agree about, the horrors visited upon the Jewish people in the Holocaust, <coughs> the atrocities that they suffered. We all can agree that that's racism and it's vile and it's, brings up the, it represents the very worst of what human beings can be. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are people who recognize the value of lives of people in a, in a, in a, in a weak uh, and marginalized ethnic group but who don't attach quite the same value to their lives as they do to the lives of others. And I regret to say that I've seen some evidence of that in our own party. And I ask myself this, and I think that this is a very instructive question to ask. Let us imagine that the situation was reversed. All of the human rights violations were the same. The torture of children, the targeting of civilian infrastructure, the unlawful killings, the expansion of settlements, the violation of the 14th Convention, the collective punishment, Let's assume that all of this was happening, but that the perpetrators were Palestinian, and that the victims were Jewish or Christian. Do we really believe that there would be people in our party opposing the BDS motion? No. I don't believe it. I really don't. And that's a hard thing to have to say, but it's true. And I hope that we all come to understand that within ourselves, and this is true of me, I've had to come to understand that about myself. That I don't, and I haven't in my lifetime, attached the same values to the lives of all persons. But at the end of the day, we must. It is what is right and true. And if we do that, then we will support this resolution without hesitation. The last thing I'm going to say is that if you agree with what I've had to say this evening, and you're not a member of the Green Party, thank you, Aaron, for reminding me of this. Uh, and if you agree with the values, this is very important, those six core values that I talked about. If you share those values and you want to defend this victory for human rights, become a member of our party. Do it before November 2nd so you're eligible to vote before Calgary. It costs you $10. If you can contribute more, that's wonderful. But you have an opportunity to defend this victory for human rights. Help and go to the SDM, too. And if you can go to Calgary, all the better. Thank you. But you have to be 30 days a member. 30 days a member. Yeah, so I, I believe Barbara's going to um, pass the basket if you want to make a contribution and we were thinking that it might help somebody go to Calgary. I think that's what the idea of that was to the convention. Another announcement is the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War announces a public forum on the liberation of Aleppo on or about November the 15th, place to be announced. Um, Ken Stone and Mark Tilliano, Tilliano, recently returned from Syria, will be speaking. The CJPME is an organization that sponsored this event tonight, and um, if you are interested in peace and justice in the Middle East, you are welcome to check out the website for that organization, and you are welcome to become members of it. There are some refreshments available in the lobby, thanks to Buddha for the apples tonight. There's also Palestinian olive oil and zatar spices um, for sale uh, from Bet's Satoon in Toronto. I want to thank you all for being part of this event tonight. Whether you're Green Party members or Palestinian, diaspora or people who are really concerned about the issues that BDS brings up for us. Thank you for being here, for listening, for participating. This is an um, important political process as well. 
Um, I, I'm very grateful for Uda Schmidt-Jones for her participation in the debate tonight and for Dimitri Vasqueros for taking part, for traveling uh, from a distance to, to be here. So thank you and good night. Thank you.